Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session of Quaker Basics. This is a program offered by Friends Meeting at Cambridge, which is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the United States. I say that because within our Zoom room, where we've just been greeting each other before going live, we have people from many states and countries as well joining us together, and I'm really excited to um, have this conversation among uh, this group of people from coming from many different locations and also many different backgrounds. Um, the topic this evening, uh, we're going to be talking about spiritual diversity among friends. And uh, so indeed, having many locations represented um, is very, very apt for our theme. Um, I'm Veronica Barron. I use she, her pronouns, and I am facilitating this session, um, which is, exists at, at Friends Meeting at Cambridge under the auspices of the FMC or Friends Meeting at Cambridge coordinating team and also our adult spiritual education working group. Um, so uh, if you enjoy this program, we invite you to you know, participate at whatever level you like, whether that's just sitting back and watching. No one will have to participate out loud if you don't want to, but there will also be opportunities for questions and participation if you'd like. Um, but I just want to welcome you to participate in whatever way feels comfortable to you, whether that's listening or chatting or speaking uh, yourself. Um, so with that, friends, um, we're just going to get started here um, by I would love to ask you to drop into the chat just a few words about what brought you here this evening to talk about this topic. Um, and you can frame that however you'd like, just a, a couple of words about how you're feeling about approaching this topic or what thoughts came to mind when you saw the idea of speaking about spiritual diversity among friends or among Quakers. Um, just a couple of words, two or three words that um, express something about what made you decide to come here this evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where you're located. Great. I love this one. I'm like, I. Um, um, time for typing and then uh, okay great so we see folks who are interested in how do we introduce Quakerism to young adults uh, how would we describe Quaker diversity great question uh, oh yes and someone who's come in thinking about non-theistic friends and how do we bring diverse Quakers together these are great questions um, let's see we have, I love Quaker diversity, me too. <laughs> um, thinking about what makes someone, oh, and actually this would be a great moment for some housekeeping. I will just note, here we are in Zoom. Um, I would like to ask that everyone, uh, when you are not speaking, if you could mute yourself, that would be um, very helpful, just so that everyone can hear as well as possible. Excellent. All right. Oh, I love these responses. I'm a non-theist friend, birthright atheist. I'm exploring my own spirituality and would like to hear other perspectives. I'm new to Quakerism, so I thought this would be a good way to learn. Excellent. Um, I love all of these responses. So whether you are someone who is just curious about Quakerism and has never attended a Quaker meeting or other Quaker activity, or someone who has attended Quaker meeting thousands of times, uh, this topic is really a very basic one of um, how do you find spiritual community within a group of people? Um, I think that's a, a big question altogether, but it's definitely a question of, of how do we do that as a community when we in fact have quite a diversity of beliefs. So um, for this evening, we will, um, we will hear from a panelist of four friends who are connected with Friends Meeting at Cambridge who represent a wide range of perspectives. And they're gonna share a little bit about uh, what kinds of things nurture their own personal Quakerism, and um, but also speak a little bit about why seek out this kind of community to nurture our spiritual lives, um, knowing that there are all kinds of different um, approaches that one could take. So, um, yeah, so I'm very excited to hear all of these reasons for what brought us together this evening. Um, and so we're going to start with just a few basics, if you will, and this is my uh, my moment to ask my trusty assistant, i.e. me, to share my screen accurately. So here we go. Okay. 
So we're going to start with some basics, some Quaker basics. So Quakerism is a non-creedal faith. We don't have a particular creed, but we do attempt to struggle to put into words sometimes some of the core things about what it is that we believe that brings us together. Broadly speaking, we affirm that there is that of God in everyone. We use many names and metaphors to describe the divine. Some of them include God, the light, Christ, spirit, the guide, the seed, the life, and the inward teacher. And I will note that different friends might choose many other words beyond these. We believe that everyone is known by God or perhaps some other word that you might use in place. We'll get more into that shortly. And that everyone can know God or light, et cetera, in a direct relationship. We are called on to attend to this relationship and be guided by it. Now on this particular topic, um, I'd like to share with you a few words that Friends Meeting at Cambridge has put together um, about 10 years ago uh, when our meeting had a lot of um, this was prior to my time in the meeting, but the meeting had a lot of um, open community discussions around this complex topic of uh, diverse theologies within one, uh, within one friends meeting. So I will share this. Um, if I could just ask, could everyone just check and make sure that you're muted? I'm just getting a little bit of background noise. Thank you. Okay, so just, I'm gonna share a few excerpts. Um, from a letter that our community put together to summarize some of those community conversations we had around diverse spiritualities. And I will share this um, in an email that we're gonna send out um, following this session. So if you'd like to read this uh, and reflect on it later or read the whole thing, you're welcome to. But some of the things our community came to. It is not easy to name the experiences that bring us to meeting and arise out of worship. Yet we wish to be part of that venerable tradition of speaking that which is beyond names, but about which we long to speak. Because of our diverse theological backgrounds, we may use very different language to express our experience of meeting for worship and the light within. Those who use the word God may know it as the name for a life-giving or saving reality that they have experienced. Others choose not to use that word because they are aware that it may be used to refer to an objectified, reified being and often results in inadequate and narrow meanings. Still other friends may not conceive of God as a being, but still reject the negation implicit in the term non-theist. Some friends have silenced themselves, simply not wishing to offend others by the names they use for the divine. There are many ways in which the meeting community has sought to open channels of communication so that we can listen beyond the words to the meaning and light that each of us brings to meeting. Through sharing in small groups and large, we began to understand that there are no homogeneous groups of theists and non-theists, Christian and non-Christian. We agreed that we could now try to hear each other's words of faith as individual expressions of spirituality and not cringe with resentment at the language. In vocal ministry, we are now hearing freer use of the language that reflects the speaker's own unique experience of spirit. Some who have been silent are once again using the words that hold meaning for them. And with that, friends, I would like to invite <laughs> to invite to the stage, which is to say, to invite to the spotlight of Zoom, um, our panelists for this evening. We have Michael Carey, Kitty and David Rush, and Emmy Mathis, who will be sharing with us this evening. So we're going to hear from each of them in turn. Um, all right, there we have all of our panelists, excellent. Hello, everybody. So we're gonna hear from each of those folks in turn. They're just gonna speak a little bit about some of the, um, the underpinnings of their personal spirituality that they bring to the table. Um, and then we're going to pull everybody back up on stage, on screen again, um, and we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation. There will be a chance for others to participate in that conversation, ask questions, share reflections as well. Um, but first of all, um, we're going to hear a little bit um, from Michael Carey, followed by Kitty and David Rush, and then Emmy Mathis will be uh, joining us third. 
So Michael, if you could kick us off by telling us a little bit about uh, the things that inform your Quakerism and the things that brought you to Quakerism uh, of all the communities that you could have chosen to nurture your spirituality. What is it about Quakerism, um, including its uh, diversity, that, um, that bring you here? Okay, there I'm, okay. There I'm on screen. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I was explaining to Veronica earlier, um, I discovered Quakerism originally through joining a peace group called Elanthus. Um, we used to vigil outside Draper Labs in Cambridge, who were at that time designing the guidance systems for accurate, uh, for nuclear missiles. So the meeting, we used to have a vigil at Draper, but also every Sunday evening um, in at the Catholic Worker House in the south end of Boston. And so the group was made up of Catholics and Quakers. And um, that's when I first really got to experience um, what a Quaker, shall we say, atmosphere was like. Um, so our meetings were, were a bit like what is referred to sometimes as, as um, worship meetings. In other words, we would um, deliberately leave space between speakers, try to listen to each other, each other intensely. And um, so that was my first very positive experience of um, of Quakerism. I myself grew up Catholic and was very active in various Catholic churches um, for many years. Um, you know, I did many years of Catholic theology. Um, and, you know, during the 60s, um, when the Vatican Council was meeting, um, I was very hopeful for lots of changes within the Catholic Church, with in particular, the one of the ideas that was very prominent there was the one idea of what they called the, the priesthood of the laity. The idea basically that God speaks to everyone and then through everyone. Um, so when I started, came to a friends meeting in Cambridge, that's what I found was true there. And so what I found in the Catholic churches I attended, it tended to be, it seemed to me that people, um, well, I don't know, use too many church words, you might say, um, without considering what they meant or putting very deep meaning to it. Whereas the opposite was true of Quakers. They, they, they spoke very carefully, listened very intently to what they were saying, and ref tried to speak out of deep reflection. Um, and that's what attracted me originally to, to Quaker meeting. The other part, of course, was activism was what really drew me as well. And, uh, you know, I've been on peace and social concerns for years and also through that got to um, get involved with uh, prison work and visiting and writing to prisoners and bringing their families to visit them um, and trying to organize a better return to society for them. So that's something that I've been that has been very supported by Friends Media in Cambridge. I've been coming to Cambridge Friends, I think, for nearly 30 years. So although I am both a Catholic and a Quaker, um, my practice is basically Quaker. Um, diversity, one of the things of my experience of the Catholic Church, of course, is that there is an awful lot more diversity within the Catholic Church than is usually acknowledged. <laughs> and. Um, the, so I had already, shall we say, come to very different beliefs than to what a lot of um, authorities in the church were saying. Um, so the practice, the Quaker practice, to me, has fitted very well into my own beliefs. Um, so I, you know, I, I basically do believe in God. I believe in Jesus and in His messages and and the, the way of life He led, and feel very inspired by that. Um, the you know, the, what you mentioned before, seeing that of God in everyone is a core belief. And, you know, to me, that matches very much with my upbringing, where forgiveness was very much very part of my Catholic upbringing. Um, the idea that there was no such thing as, as unforgiven. Um, um, so I not found it a problem that people um, don't um, 
have the same belief. Um, we do, uh, however, what I really like about Quakerism is this attention to meaning uh, that what we say, we do what we say, basically. Um, so maybe I'll finish there for the moment. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, and we'll get more into some of those topics in a moment. So now if we could pull Kitty and David up onto the screen. Oh, wonderful. Okay, how's that? Um, David and I belong to a rather uh, substantial subset of Quakers called non-theists. And Michael hears that as a negative term, but actually it's, a, it's an effort not to say atheist because we think that the term atheist suggests that we think nobody has a God, there isn't a God for anybody. And what we're just saying is that the people in who identify as non-theists, we don't have a God. So um, it's been useful to me, I don't know whether it's useful to you, to not use the word belief, but to speak about experience. So all I can say is I don't experience God. You know, I spoke at a friend's meeting a couple of years ago and People told me that friends said, oh, I, I experienced God's love and it's so important to me. Or I experienced God as keeping me safe in dangerous situations. I think that's absolutely amazing. And I would not for a minute say there's anything invalid about that ex those experiences, but I don't have them. So I don't experience God. And I might say, I don't believe in God, but I, that seems to set people off. So I'm not going to put it that way. Um, Non-theist friends wrote a book called Godless for God's Sake. I hope it's in the meeting library. If not, we'll send you a copy. It's quite interesting. Um, I would say that three, I can name three main things that tie me to Quakerism. Um, one is the testimonies. I absolutely am in complete harmony with the testimonies. They seem to me like banisters that you could hold on to as you go up and down the stairs of life and very important. I have two kinds of experiences which I would characterize as mystical that I associate with Quakerism. One is the gathered meeting or whatever enables us to come to unity is a kind of a, an amazing real happening that I can't explain, I can't describe. It's a mystical, mysterious miracle that happens in Friends Meeting at Cambridge and or Friends meeting, I'm now going to a friends meeting in New Hampshire. Um, the other kind of um, <laughs> thought about this for a while now, now I've completely lost it. Well, I've completely lost one of my thoughts, but I'll make up another one. Um, I think we all want to feel in in a unity beyond that unity that we feel in meaningful worship. And I think the Quaker um, emphasis on experience encourages that. Uh, I think creeds tend to separate one from other people or other life experiences. And if you just say, no, I am open and I realize that I'm connected in some way to the wider world, I think Quakerism permits that. I think that Quakerism encourages people like me, supports us um, through a couple of Quaker uh, phrases. One is that of God in everyone. So I don't believe in a spirit, a being, something separate from myself, but I understand that there's something 
in me that is similar to what other people are talking about when they speak of God. And the other is, um, what canst thou say? It seems to me that Quakerism says, what you say, what you bring out of yourself is what you should bring. That's good. That is authentic and it reflects your integrity. And that's all I'm going to say for now and I'll turn it over to my husband. Can you hear me? Okay. A little bit about my journey because my journey is a little complicated. Uh, I was born in 1934, so I'm 87. And I'm on the, one of my parts of journey at the moment is that I have Parkinson's disease. So that my voice is hesitant, but my, I believe my brain is still working. So you'll have to be hesitant along with me for a little bit. My parents are immigrants. My grandparents were murdered and half my father's family were murdered. I was bar mitzvahed and that was the last time I considered anything to be that the universe held benign structure for the rest for the, for for human humanity i was inculcated in the idea that we are responsible for each other but nobody beyond each other is going to do much in the way of helping us out and sometimes each other is going to be very dangerous i'm a sci i'm a scientist a retired scientist i'm not i wouldn't do very well now i'm, a, I'm an epidemiologist and actually know a lot about the, the epidemic that a lot of people seem not to have known. I came to Quakers first when I was 20, and I spent the summer in a Quaker work camp in Mexico. And I became convinced that this is a group of people whose values I, tr I trusted. They were people who were flawed in the way that all of us are flawed but trying to do well, trying to be good. I have a strong sense that intentionality is very, very high in our, in our group. Kitty and I have been part of the Quaker meeting in Cambridge for 30 years. And we've held almost every position in the meeting. And we've had Veronica Red read some pieces that were created years ago. We wrote an epistle about our, along with those who were theists, we, are, we, we wrote an epistle which we worked on very hard. I don't know if it's ever circulated in the meeting. Oh, it's on the website. Okay, good. If, if you want to know more about my non-theism, I strongly suggest you Google Universalist Friends Rush, and you will get the results of my research as a fellow at Woodbrook in England, where I was an Eva, Eva Koch fellow 20 years ago and studied 200 Quakers who responded to a questionnaire which I sent out. I found the experience of reading the responses, half of which were from this country and half from the UK, a few from other elsewhere, but they, they were, that was basically the distribution, were deeply moving. These were very experienced Quakers. The average time in Quakerism was about 25 years. And they were all very committed to the process of being a Quaker, but not committed to a theology other than 
in very different and personal and sometimes close to th spirit to the supernatural but i solicit i solicited their participation by saying i would like to talk to people who are primarily do not use the supernatural as a reference we've had a wonderful time in quakerism we had no participation in groups other than work and family until we got involved with the Quaker meeting. We brought up our children as ethical and social, social, socially committed beings, and our grandchildren seem to be in the, following the same path. And I think Quakerism has meant enormous interjection of good people into our lives. And we found some more here in New Hampshire where we're now living after our daughter who lives nearby got sick and we came to live here. So the, I'll, stop, I'll there, stop there, but I do recommend you look, read the research. It really is pretty interesting. Thank you, David. And we'll be sharing out um, all of those things um, in an email to attendees later so you can do more reading on your own. Um, thank you. So we now have our uh, fourth panelist, Emmy Mathis, who's going to share a little bit about the things that inform her Quakerism, and then we'll have all of us join together for a larger conversation. Hi. Glad to be here, Veronica. Thanks for putting this together and inviting me. Um, well, my name is Emmy, and I am what they call a convinced Quaker, which means I um, wasn't born into it. Um, and I have a pretty diverse spiritual background. I was raised in a conservative Christian home and I could never really align Christ's teachings with the Bible and the way my parents raised me and what, what the church was telling me. They didn't, they didn't line up. And so, um, so I kind of tried to hold on to the concept of prayer and, and um, like the life and work of Christ and just let everything else go. Um, I think for a little while I was an atheist <laughs> and then agnostic and then um, in my early 30s I started practicing Buddhism and I loved the quietness of it and I loved all of the inner work that was required for that and um, I really appreciated that there was this idea that we are all that we can all be Buddha um, and that it was um, a nonviolent spirituality, um, and that it was a practice that, that it was, there was an action, there were actions involved. Um, and then I had children, and Buddhists really don't do childcare that well. And so I literally came to Quakerism because I had childcare. Um, which I think is funny at first. And I think it's also a deep, deep reflection of their equality, their equality testimony. testimony. And that and is that really is meaningful. Really meaningful. Um, and before I had children, I wouldn't have realized how important that was. But what I've noticed from Quakers is that they try to wrap around everyone. They, you know, in, in our flawed way. Um, and the first Quaker, the first Quaker meeting I started to attending was I started attending was the Atlanta Friends meeting. And there, they are um, very, very deeply steeped in anti-racism work and um, deconstructing white supremacy culture. 
and so I really equated anti-racism work with Quakerism, and I've kept those together for, um, yeah, I've tried to kind of keep those together. And I was most impressed with Quakerism and wanted to stay, not just for the childcare and the quiet <laughs> worship, um, with this idea of um, faith in action. And so it felt like an extension and an expansion of my Buddhist practice because there, it's, um, it's a living, it's a moving faith. It's a spirituality that has flesh and takes actionable steps. Uh, since then, I've added several other spiritual practices. I just keep collecting them. Um, I, I practice uh, several now 12-step recovery groups. Um, and they, they really help open me up to the idea that there is, I always believed that there was a loving force um, that I never knew that I was being held by it. And so with recovery, I've really kind of come to feel like I am under the care of a loving universe, spirit, whatever you call it. I definitely don't have a personified idea of God, but sometimes I just use God because it's one syllable word. Um, and then I've also begun practicing kind of more earth-based ritualistic practices and they all feel really, again, held by my Quaker faith. Um, and I like the way they go together it feels good i don't ever feel like anything's in conflict uh, and i think that what's so important to me about quakerism is that there is contemplation worship uh, radical equality and action from from the stillness thank you emmy Thank you very much to all of our panelists. So we're about to jump into um, pulling all of our panelists together. But before we do, um, I just want to ask each of you who are in the um, in this session as a participant to just take a moment. You could grab a piece of paper if you want, or just close your eyes and think your thoughts to yourself. But I want to invite you to um, think about, um, either with eyes closed or with your paper writing down, um, a time when you felt concerned, um, whether it's a spiritual context or not, that if you put something into words using the words that felt natural to you, that maybe you might be rejected or judged or someone might not welcome the way that you understand your own experiences. So just take a moment and think about a time where you were worried if, um, you know, what if I say this in the, in the words that feel best to me? And you can just either with eyes closed thinking or writing down, just write down a few, two or three words that describe that feeling or a moment when you felt that way. And if you're willing to share in the chat those words or phrases, or how that felt, please go ahead and do so. I'm sorry, Veronica, I had to take a spam phone call. Can you ask the question again, please? Sure thing, Kitty. So I'm asking people to think about a moment. So we've just heard uh, all of these wonderful experiences. So just take a moment to think about um, a moment when you felt nervous about sharing uh, something about what you really feel, your real experiences, um, if, you, if, you, if you were to say this, would you be accepted? And just thinking about a few words for how that feels. And you can either hold that thought for yourself or you're welcome to share it in the chat if you'd like. And then a second prompt, I wanna invite, so while I'm sure we've all had, either in a spiritual context or otherwise, some moments where we felt unsure about whether it was okay to say things, you know, um, in a spiritual context, it could be like, if I tell people that, you know, like if I tell people I 
am not a theist, will I be accepted? If I tell people I'm a Christian, will I be accepted? If I tell people, you know, whatever spiritual language feels natural to you, um, will I be accepted? I hope that we've also perhaps had some experiences where we did feel deeply accepted and affirmed. So if you would just take a moment, either with your eyes closed or with your piece of paper, or considering that it's 2021, maybe your note on your phone that you've just opened. So just take a moment to think about a moment that you took the chance, you put it into words, and you did feel uh, accepted and affirmed um, for whatever, whatever language you personally would use. Just take a moment to remember what that felt like. And either you can capture that in your brain, take a snapshot, we'll come back to this later. You can drop it in the chat if you wanna share it now or just keep your little notes nearby. Um, but we'll come to, back to that later with our small, our small group breakouts. And with those experiences in mind, knowing that it is very likely that uh, we have all had, you know, the whole bandwidth of those kinds of experiences. Um, so now I'd like to ask us to, uh, Jennifer, if you could uh, pull us, pull me and the panelists up on screen. Um, we're going to have a little group conversation. I think you're all set. Excellent. Great. So, um, oh, this is lovely. So in the chat, I see I felt for decades that I am a Quaker, but I believed that because I'm an atheist, I couldn't be. Yeah, that's, I hear that. Of, uh, a very few Quakers have become undone by learning of our beliefs. Yeah, yeah, I think both of those. Uh, let's see here. Ah, oh, I love this, that's so evocative. With the first prompt, I felt resigned. With the second, I felt shocked pleasantly. I can feel that too when I think about some of my own memories of those, those moments. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, I would love to hear um, from the panelists first, if there is um, anything that, um, that surprised you or um, that came to new light for you either while you were speaking just now on this panel or while you were preparing your remarks to address this topic? Was there any, anything new that came up for you? Well, one thought that just came to me uh, was, you know, each year um, we hold, uh, Friends Meeting Cambridge holds a, um, a prayer vigil on, on Boston Common on Good Friday. And for years, I was involved in writing the um, a leaflet that we gave out at that at that time, and and of course, going through the process of having of writing the leaflet and getting accepted by meeting was always one of these um, where you know you you try to make sure that what you were saying was being understood in the way that you meant it to be understood, and wasn't. Um, causing distress to others. So the, um, and in particular, of course, being Good Friday, w we had to deal with the um, history of, of anti-Semitic behavior around Good Friday. So, um, um, so that became a whole, a very fruitful, I think, discussion um, around, you know, what we, you know, what we mean and, and um, why we were st why we were standing there on a particular day. Wait, I'm muted. Thank you, Michael. Kitty, could we hear from you on that? Well, it's amazing to me. You know, we're living in times of enormous change, and I actually have lived through an enormously, uh, an, an era of enormous change. Um, when we first joined Friends Meeting at Cambridge, we felt that it was very important 
to tell the committee that we were not conforming um, because maybe they would decide that we shouldn't join the meeting. Um, and actually, my the very dear people on our committee had already decided that we should join the meeting and they didn't really pay much attention to all the warning flags that we put up. But we found over the years, and I found quite recently, that some people are really very upset if you are not able to use the language that they know and love. And I had an experience a couple of years, at Friend, years ago at Friends General Conference, which is the annual meeting of liberal Quakers held in different college campuses in the early part of the summer. Um, I gave my little talk, uh, but it, uh, on schedule, and I had called it um, New Bottle Quakerism, because I wanted to say that I think Quakerism has something new to offer. Into this little session that Friends General Meeting had, had, had permitted the non theist friends came four or five steely-eyed, rigid-backed Quakers. And they sat in a circle and would not make eye contact and were tremendously upset by our, by my presence and by my idea. I don't quite know <laughs> what it was they thought I was going to say. Um, whether they thought that because I was talking about new bottles that I was keen on smashing traditional papers. And so I, I did not have the experience, Veronica, of saying, of feeling afraid that I would upset somebody and finding that I did not upset them. I have the experience of thinking, oh, we're all grown up so we can handle it. And that people were very upset and very angry with me. So I think it's not as easy as it sounds in this setting to have divergent um, ways of divergent religious experience. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Kitty, because I think that um, one of the things I find really interesting about this topic is that it, it actually, it can be quite difficult to uh, communicate a, 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 and just for anyone who is um, newer, I just want to address Kitty mentioned uh, becoming a member. And um, so part of the process of officially becoming a member of a Quaker meeting is to meet with a group of other friends and have something called a clearness committee where you determine, uh, you, you discern uh, whether it is in fact to do to join the meeting. Um, but I think that one of the things that I observe is that I, it's very clear to me that it can be difficult to, um, to find unity across difference, but I also find that it can be very rewarding to do. And I know that for me, I've had experiences of um, hearing, hearing language in a meeting um, that is not what I would use. And I've, I've had my hackles raised sometimes and thought, oh no, are they expecting me to believe that same thing or you know, that I would say it the same way? Um, but one of the things that I, I've noticed is that um, for me, at least, one of the things that made me feel at home in a Quaker meeting is to realize, well, if he can say that, or if they can say that, or she can say that, then surely what I, you know, in the what canst thou say, like, then surely I could say what I might say. Um, so that's just, you know, my own personal example of like, there's some of the difficulty, but also some of the things that, um, being in a diverse community offers that have been a surprise, a pleasant surprise, much like uh, the response in the chat of um, surprise pleasantly. Um, that's been one of uh, one of mine. And I'm curious to hear from all of you, if you, uh, you might have your own version of that or a different one, but have there been any moments like that or pleasant surprises of, oh, actually it's very clear how it's hard. Uh, what are the things that, um, feel almost like, wow, what a bonus or a value add or a, it's actually great that we don't think of the same things. 
Have any of you ever had a moment like that within your Quaker faith? Mm. Oh, absolutely. Because um, it's hard for me to, to hear some uh, conventional Orthodox Christian language. And then I get to know the people who are speaking it. And oh, how good and generous and um, valuable they are. So that's uh, very um, encouraging. And I just want to pick up on what Michael said, that there's a, probably a greater diversity in Catholicism than people realize. Of course, we're human, no two the same. And in every religious community, there's probably a lot of diversity. I mean, there's the same diversity that there is among us as individuals. But we have found it not necessarily not necessary to hide that in the Quaker community. I've had very many experiences of coming together with people where we were hesitant at first, and we became very close as we learned each other's inner being and better selves. And I think the meeting is a place where one can practice having one's better self a lot better than the grocery store and work. So I, it's been... I've been enormously grateful at the gift that the Quakers have, Quakerism has been for us. Our children tell us we're nicer than we used to be. I wonder, Emmy, if you could share with us a little bit as someone who, as you mentioned, you just keep collecting spiritual practices. Um, how um, has your, does that sense of uh, diversity within a group feel like something that's relevant to you? Um, and has that changed over time as you've collected new spiritual practices? I, I was just kind of giggling to myself and I was like, I don't know if I should say this, but I guess I'm going to. Um, when I first started off at, at, at Atlanta Friends Meeting, I didn't really know that there were Quakers who felt very deeply aligned with kind of like the Christ Center. <laughs> and I had been going right I mean, me. we can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Is that better? Okay. Um, thanks. Um, I... I had been attending the um, Atlanta Friends meeting for over a year, and reg I was regularly attending, very active in the life of the meeting there. And, um, and um, I don't think, I didn't even realize that there were people there that felt like, like they identified as Christian um, until I was speaking to someone, someone who wasn't, wasn't originally from Atlanta. He was a Quaker. He was a, He was born Quaker, and he had kind of, moved to the Atlanta area and he said something about how it was still a religion and I was the, I, was, I don't know it took me a second and I felt I felt almost shocked and it, it took me a little while to, to realign and I just did what I normally do I was like oh okay <laughs> like, um but I think that I think that I tend to I think I am actually really curious to know what Quakerism looks like as a religion, because I see it so much as a practice um, and a faith. And I, I don't know what it looks like to see it practiced as a religion. Um, and I know that there are people that, that do. Um, and my experience in, in Quakerism has been so, so diverse. Um, and so I and tend so to feel I very feel comfortable, comfortable and I, I don't know, I, if I don't know if just, I just somehow just gravitate, somehow gravitate towards, people towards people who are more like me or if it is as diverse 
as I as it appears to be. Um, but for me, it seems to be about as diverse as, as I guess I <laughs> I think. Um, So I have some more questions for you all, but I would also like to open things up to the rest of our participants. And um, in a custom that we began at last month's Quaker Basics, um, I would like to open things up first to, um, so I know that we have a, of the registrants for these events, we tend to have people ranging from, I am brand new to Quakerism. I have heard of it, but I've never attended anything ever to people who have been attending for a few months, to people who have been attending for decades. So knowing that we have quite a lot of folks in the room, um, I wanna open the floor up first to people who have been, who are the newest on that list. So if you have been attending a Quaker meeting, if you've never attended or have attended for a year or less, um, the, the floor for questions is yours first. So if you have a question, uh, you can either raise your Zoom hand if you would like to appear on screen, which will put you up on screen for the live screen, uh, the live stream and the saved video as well. Or you can drop your question or your just response, what's on your mind, what's rising up for you in this conversation. Uh, and you can drop that in the chat and I will read it. And I think while we are, so all of those newer folks it is also, again, totally okay to hang back. But while you're thinking your thoughts about what questions you might ask, um, and everyone else who's been attending longer can think your thoughts as well, I would like to, um, to ask our panelists to just, uh, it seems as if one of the, one of the things about uh, this topic that seems to rise up in some of your remarks um, is this idea of, um, I want to kind of come back to something that I believe Kitty raised of the idea of what canst thou say, um, which uh, is a very often repeated Quaker phrase spoken first by George Fox, one of the founders of Quakerism. Um, is there, when you think about spiritual diversity within friends, I think that this notion of um, listening for that inward voice or that inward guide or what canst thou say, okay. it's like, comes up very strongly in this topic. And I am wondering, would any of you like to share, has, uh, has there been a moment within your spiritual practice where you learn to trust that voice more? I think for me, it, um, it came learning how, oh, sorry. For me, it came um, learning how and when to speak in meetings or in committees or um, business meetings. Uh, I remember I, I've taught forever. I'm a talker. I literally had professors ask me to talk less, <laughs> um, which is fine. Because <laughs> then at some point in time, I learned that the people who don't talk first actually have things to say that would have never occurred to me because they have a completely different view of the world than I do. Um, but I remember just like kind of knowing the basic concepts of Quakerism and, and sitting in meetings the first few times just not with like, how do you know when to talk? And I hadn't introduced myself, even though they asked people to introduce themselves. And all of a sudden, I literally felt like I was physically being kicked out of my chair just to say my name just to stand up at the end and say my name and I it was like whoosh and it was such a visceral response and I've kind of learned that to really try to discern the difference between feeling led by spirit to speak versus kind of getting popcorny in my head and feeling like there's something that I need to say. Um, and for me, that's been really, really intense, um, the way that it feels to speak in meeting. And I've actually tried to pull that into my day-to-day -day life. And is it necessary? Is it spirit-led? Um, am I being of service when I speak? And, and, and what and, and to what service am I speaking to? 
Thanks, Amy. <laughs> I was gonna say it's usually how I know I need to say something because I'll start to I'll start to quake and I'll, it won't even I'll like be at a dinner table, you know, <laughs> just like okay, this is something that I'm supposed to speak up on. Thank you. I'm reminded too of in one of the earlier Quaker Basic sessions, one of our first ones, we had a whole conversation about how do you know when to speak, and a lot of the things that you've just said. Um, came up in that conversation of like, it's not just what happens in a meeting of whether I should speak, but it then can carry out into the rest of your life as well. Um, ah, so we have a, I love this question. Um, so we have a question for the group, for the panelists. Um, I struggle with conveying acceptance of very different viewpoints without accidentally acting like I share them. Does anyone have tips? This is a great question. <laughs> I appreciate that facial expression you made, Michael. It kind of spoke to how I was like, oh yeah, that's tricky. Yeah, but it's a great one. Oh, Michael, uh, could you unmute yourself? Unmute, there we go, unmute. Um, I must say, I, I struggle with exactly the same thing because, <laughs> um, and one of the things that originally struck me so much about Quakers was their tolerance. <laughs> Coming from a Catholic background, tolerance is not a, a very strong, <laughs> a strong part of, of my Catholic upbringing. So the idea of, of, of accepting a viewpoint with which you totally disagree, I find, you know, I find I very much struggle with that. Um, and I must say, I would not have an answer as to how you could do it well. Um, but I've seen many Quakers do it well. So, uh, you know, it is something presumably comes through a good Quaker experience. Michael, when you think about having seen Quakers do that well, um, does anything come to mind for you as what made you know, like, oh, wow, that friend really did, <laughs> they did a great job. Um, well, it, well, basically, it, it, it be, it's because they were able to get a different viewpoint. Um, by being positive to begin, you know, being positive towards the person. Basically, um, you know, when we when we used to vigil outside Draper Labs in Cambridge, um, you know, we were forever reminding ourselves that, you know, we were against the product that these people were producing, but we didn't regard them as evil, you know, that we had to, that we saw them as people who were, um, and could treat them as people. And um, so that was something I witnessed quite a few times because we, you know, part of what we did there was to trespass on Draper property and deal with the, you know, the reaction from Draper employees. Um, but as you say, it, it's kind of, it's beginning with a very positive attitude of, of um, rather than reacting to the negativity you've heard. In a way, Michael, it's, sorry, did I cut you off? No, I'm saying if that makes sense. I mean, that's that's how it comes to me. Well, I wanted to reflect back that in what you're saying, it um, in a way, it sounds like you're speaking about hearing some, uh, some negativity coming at you potentially, um, but hearing underneath that. And it strikes me that that's almost like the inverse of, we were talking a little bit earlier about like listening under the words that our fellow friends are using it can feel really nice to think about that when it's uh, um, I don't know like a nice feeling set of words of like oh I see that's meaningful to you and then it can be um, it just occurs to me with what you said that uh, listening under the words is true regardless of you know what kind of emotional content the words have or what kind of situation you're in. Mm Emmy, did you want to jump in on that? Oh, and I'm sorry, I see. Do you mind? I'm going to go to Kitty first and then back to Emmy. So the, the question was kind of a, uh, a strategy. He's, I think the questioner is saying, how can I, what should I say? When somebody says, whatever, 
And I think there are two things that I, I have in mind. One is, in your own mind, form the, the work from the idea that that speaker is a good person. So he may be talking about the blood of the lamb, and you may think, Ugh! <laughs> but go towards him with the feeling that he's trying to express his goodness in words that you might not use, but to understand what's behind what he's saying. And the other thing, I, th I think if you need to have a response, you have to respond to this person who said something that really doesn't work for you. See if you can find what part of it works, or if you can say, I'm glad that that works for you. I'm happy that that um, makes you feel safer or is comforting to you. I'm glad that you feel comforted by that belief. Never mind the fact that you yourself might be very uncomfortable when you encounter that belief. But you could be pleased for the other person that it works for them. Thank you, Kitty. Emmy, did you want to jump in on that one as well? Uh, that would be great. Thanks. Um, two things just kind of really popped into my mind. Um, and the, the first one was that when Atlanta Friends Meeting was really struggling with a decision, someone stood up and, and stated that, that they had been told that during, um, during a crisis in Ireland, the Quakers were the only people that fed both the um, Protestants and the Catholics. And it just felt extremely meaningful to me. Um, and I was listening to, I, I heard Ben Pink Dandelion speak once and he said that the um, Quakers, like the Quaker women writers in, in like the 18th, 19th century, they would, they wrote so differently than, because he was like studying how they wrote. I'm sorry for using binary gender terms, um, but that he really expressed that the, the Quaker women um, in like the 17, 1800s, they would end their letters to politicians um, saying, I love your soul. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, it just kind of like brings me to this space of, of um, there's a difference between neutrality, right? Like it's, it's just not okay to be neutral anymore versus um, finding that of God in everyone and finding a connection. Um, and I am just also really thinking about these uh, I've, so, I've sat through several um, Quaker, Quaker based trainings on microaggressions. And so I think to specifically respond to the question, um, I think one that I know that for me, I'm completely powerless over what someone thinks that I think. I can't, I can't control that. And if they think I agree with them, I, I, I'm powerless over that. And uh, if I come, and I think that to kind of align with my relationship with spirit and with Quakerism, is if I come down into my body and in the microaggression trainings, they, they say like, just like that feels funny in my body and to just name it and, and to, to like, kind of like for me, get in there and just be like, oh, wow, I actually feel really uncomfortable right now. Um, I need to take a minute or would you be willing to explain or I'm not okay with that statement. Um, and that's actually not something that I agree with. And that there is a way to speak that I think really comes from um how much care Quakers put into words like I was I was talking to my friend who is also new to Quakerism and I asked him to be on a committee of mine and he just started to laugh and make fun of Quaker meeting for worship or business meeting and he just he's like have they ever come to a decision ever and I'm like yes <laughs> it just takes a little while and we like to be very careful with our words and I remember when we were working on the financial document like we spent hours together figuring out how to word a sentence so that it felt fair 
and and good and aligned with all of our values. Um, and so I think, again, just kind of coming in, where am I at in my body? Where do I feel this in my body? And how do I name that? And how do I say I'm uncomfortable with this? Or I need to take a moment to walk away from this? Or I, I don't agree with you. And to just kind of like know that I'm okay and that I'm still safe. Um, and to, to try to kind of like avoid neutrality and also really live into peace, the, the peace testimony. Thank you all. I love that question and I really love that array of answers. So friends, wow, we are really hopping and I could continue this conversation for quite a long time, even more time than we have. But um, we've come to uh, the point in the evening where um, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, um, to connect with each other in some smaller group conversations around these topics as well. So what's going to happen now is that we are going to um, close down the live stream. Although if you are someone who's watching in the live stream, you are welcome to real quick grab yourself a spot in the event, right? If you want to join in on this part of the conversation and we'll, we'll be happy to see you here. <laughs> Uh, in the Zoom room. But um, so all who wish to are going to hop out into three person breakout rooms. I will also just note that if you're a person who's like, I kind of want to hang back, um, you're welcome to just decline your breakout room invitation and hang out in the, the big room, if you will, uh, with myself and the other facilitators of this session. So we're going to send folks out into little three person breakout groups. Um, and you're going to have just a few minutes to talk to each other about. Um, so I'd like you to start by sharing with each other either the snapshot in your brain or the things you wrote down about um, what does it feel like in a moment when you are, you know, wondering if you're going to, if you can say what you really feel about, you know, whatever topic it is that's near and dear to your heart and what it felt like uh, when you thought about a moment when, um, when you were affirmed, when you took the chance. And then from there, you can, you can jump off into uh, connecting with each other a little bit about uh, this topic. So we're going to go ahead and bid good night to those who are watching us via the Facebook Live. Good night, Facebook Live friends, and we hope to see you next month for next month's Quaker Basics. And for the rest of 